find shortcuts to personal fortune. Jesus held firm in the self-realization and self-control as he said, Get thee hence, Satan. The important truth is that you are a spiritual being within the allness of infinite mind within you. Whatever your needs may be, the answer is not to get God to give you more through some divine sleight of hand process, but rather to uncover and release your own imprisoned splendor. Avoid the temptation to try to work the law and thus to materialize the process. Get your mind off the idea of making a demonstration in life. Center your awareness on a deeper sense of life, and the demonstration will begin to make you. Well-intentioned enthusiasts of new thought often echo the misleading cliché, expect a miracle. It is supposed to encourage one to expect more from life, which is good. However, it is walking right into a trap. So I say, against the grain of the majority of most contemporary teachings and teachers of truth, don't expect a miracle. If you center your consciousness in the expectations of miracles, you are playing with universal law, hoping for some magic arbitration of its inexorable activity. You are putting the whole weight of your consciousness on the side of belief in a universe of caprice. It is spiritual naivete which dilutes all that you may have built up in the awareness of changelessness of divine law. This is certainly not to express skepticism of the tremendous power to heal or prosper or to question in any way the full implications of the statement, all things are possible. When we deal with changeless law, we have even more faith in the process, but we don't have to play games. When the widow's oil was increased, it was not through divine intervention in human affairs, but the exploitation of divine law on a higher level of awareness. Certainly, all things are possible, not because God makes an exception for you by reason of your plea, but because your faith is the key to the kingdom of the power within you to apply the laws that transcend human limitation. Again, we say, don't expect a miracle. Don't reduce the practice of truth to the naive effort to coact a magic showcasing from a reticent God. If you really believe that you are entitled to the fullness of the kingdom, the resulting outforming may appear to be miraculous, for wonderful things can and will be done, but it is the natural fulfillment of divine law. The healing you long for, the overcoming you desire, the prosperity and success you have been praying for so persistently, even though you may feel that there are fantastic odds to overcome, these things do not call for miracles, but for the disciplined application of divine law and the steady effort to know God. The great ideal of spiritual seeking is to be in tune with the infinite, to traffic in such thoughts as only a miracle can save him and it is impossible but I expect a miracle is to be in tune with the indefinite think about this get it clearly established in consciousness there are no miracles in an orderly universe all things are possible under divine law one of the most self-limiting attitudes of the whole human race is the belief in chance or luck. Occasionally, it is said, I have been lucky. My prayer was answered. However, God doesn't deal in luck. As Emerson says, the dice of God are always loaded. The belief in luck crowds out real faith and lulls all true initiative to sleep. And yet so many people think that prosperity and success are simply the results of good luck and that financial reverses, unemployment, even illnesses are misfortunes or bad luck. It is the most flourishing excuse for all human difficulties. It soothes the conscious and presents the person as an innocent victim of an unknown sinister force. We say in an almost pious declaration of self-defense, I couldn't do much about it. I was just unlucky. It is often in this consciousness of spiritual immaturity that a person may turn to the will of fortune as a way to strike it rich. A person may have an urgent financial need and think, I will make my demonstration by picking the winning lottery number. 
Traditional religion has often muddled the issue by preaching on the sin of gambling. There is nothing immoral about games of chance. If one has the means and wants to be entertained by picking horses or playing roulette, then let that person enjoy himself or herself in clear conscience. However, it may become a source of spiritual limitation if the gambler is not spending available funds and entertainment, but is desperately trying to make his or her fortune. It is a self-delusive trap, for in an orderly universe, there is simply no way in which you can get something for nothing. Under divine law, you receive as you have given, no more or no less. If you feel you have been down on your luck, don't succumb to the temptation to try to make it big in some game of choice or chance. Your fortune begins with you. Not with the roll of the dice, or with the lottery winning number, or any kind of lucky break. There is only one way in which you can change your luck, and that is by altering your thoughts. How inadvertently and yet surely we corrupt the ideals of children by precept and by example, we teach them that life is to be found and experienced out there in the world. Thus, when they arrive at the age of responsibility, they are urged to go out into the world to make their fortune. They are progressively introduced to the ideas of getting breaks, of expecting success to come in one stroke of good fortune, and they set a veritable minefield of traps for themselves so that they experience career frustrations, the layoffs, and the investment failures are all the results of bad breaks. How blessed are the children who early in life are taught that their fortune begins with them. They will grow into spiritually mature adults who are confident that they have the potential in themselves to set into operation the fundamental process which will cause all things in the world to work for their good. They will know that their fortune is not something to find but to unfold. Educated religious beliefs to the contrary notwithstanding, the average person's living philosophy centers at a point somewhere between belief in kesmic, the inevitability of fate and destiny, and the luck of the draw, with a subtle effort to change that luck in every conceivable way. A farmer may install a horseshoe over the barn door. One may carry a special charm or amulet in one's pocket. Religious people are among the most superstitious, though they justify the practices as being a part of their religious teaching. Call them what you will. All the little charms, medallions, and figurines that people wear or carry or hang on their doorposts or dashboards are done essentially for good luck. They constitute an attempt to alter what Voltaire calls the canonization of events. However, life is not a game of chance. Your fortune is not influenced by caprice. It is determined by the shape of your consciousness. In Julius Caesar's Shakespeare put into the mouth of Cassius the meaningful statement, The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. It is sad to hear someone insist that some ironic twist of fate has ruined his or her life. One man was dismissed from his job. The result is he is bordering on a complete mental collapse. He says, My life is over. It is the end of everything. He talks of the lucky break he had in getting the job many years earlier. He wonders how his dismissal now could reverse the stroke of good fortune that established me in my career. The problem is really quite obvious. He has established his whole career on the flimsy platform of chance. Time and time again, he has repeated the words, how lucky I was to get this job, in a very real sense through all the years he has been working on the sword of Democles. For if you live in the belief of good luck as the key of getting ahead, Then the other side of the coin is that bad luck can frustrate your progress. You simply cannot have one without the other. The man had set the trap for himself, and thus his bad fortune, too, began with him. Your prosperity and success and your good fortune certainly may be influenced by changing conditions, but even then, depending upon how you deal with them, however, your good is always deeply rooted in what Jesus called the kingdom of God within. And when he said, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, he was also saying that your fortune is an unborn possibility of limitless life, and yours is the privilege of giving birth to it. 
As Walt Whitman sings, henceforth, I ask not in good fortune. I myself am good fortune. A great idea that may help you to unlearn some of the errors of human consciousness is this. I am a most important person to God, for I am God's living enterprise. God is not off somewhere in space where you must strain to reach him to get him to work a miracle for you, if you are lucky. God is on your side. God has taken you. God is not someone to reach for, but a presence to accept. Instead of dwelling on how difficult things are for you, turn often to the center of your being and relax in the assurance that you are God's living enterprise and that your good fortune is secure because it is God's good pleasure to give it to you. Is it possible that a person may actually be a Jonah? In the Bible story, Jonah was thrown overboard because the crew attributed all its misfortunes to Jonah's unlucky influence. Al Cap had a classic cartoon character, Joe, who always dressed in black and wore a crooked hat and had a black cloud over his head. Wherever he went, misfortune occurred. Machines broke down, feuds broke out, hens didn't lay, weapons misfired, and everything unfortunate that could happen did happen.